Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, we report on how women seeking an abortion in Turkey face considerable risks and many hurdles despite the procedure being legal. Also, why are women consistently blamed for crimes committed against them? We'll be talking to British academic Dr Jessica Taylor, who's written a book on that very subject. And a group of Singaporean female students have developed a virtual reality program so that women can fight back against sexual harassment. But we begin in Turkey, where the recent death of a young woman has shocked the nation. She died after getting an illegal abortion when she failed to obtain her husband's permission. Yet abortion has been legal in Turkey for nearly four decades and is even free of charge. But in the last 10 years, the political climate has made it almost impossible to terminate a pregnancy, as our France 24 team in Istanbul report. Abortions may be legal in Turkey, but they're increasingly difficult to obtain and socially frowned upon. This 26-year-old woman shared her story on the condition that she remain anonymous. The day she found out she was pregnant last September, she panicked. Fearing her family's reaction and no longer on speaking terms with her ex-boyfriend, she confided in a friend. Together, they called three public hospitals in Istanbul. In the end, she went to a private clinic and paid 1,200 Turkish lira, a third of her monthly salary, for a procedure that's free when performed in a public hospital. A recent study shows less than 8% of public hospitals in Turkey agree to perform abortions for non-medical reasons, and only one in Istanbul. The doctors' union has raised the issue with the government to no avail. In Turkey, the government gives you the right in theory. So abortion is legal because we have a government that wants to be a modern state. They keep it in the law but prevent people from getting one in practice. Since it was legalized in 1983, single Turkish women have the right to an abortion until the 10th week of pregnancy without a man's permission. Married women need the approval of their husband. But Recep Tayyip Erdogan, a champion of traditional family values, openly disapproves of the practice and has even likened abortions to murder. Three is good, four is better, five is awesome. Reproductive rights in Turkey is this American academic specialty. She says current attitudes on abortion are consistent with Turkey's pronatalist stance. This isn't an issue of this is women's individual rights or these are the rights to family planning. It's about the health of the nation, the health of the population. We need a strong economy. In order to have a strong economy, we need everybody to have children. For women dealing with an unwanted pregnancy, however, fewer options can lead to greater isolation, especially for those in unstable home environments. Now, the majority of us have experienced it as women, that we are somehow to be held responsible for being victims of sexual harassment or violence, either because of the way we may have dressed or the way we behaved. British academic Dr Jessica Taylor is the founder of Victim Focus, an organisation which aims to challenge the victim blaming of women subjected to violence and abuse. A specialist in forensic and criminal psychology, she's gone on to write a book aptly entitled Why Women Are Blamed for Everything. She joins me now from the UK. Dr Taylor, thank you very much for your time. What prompted you to write the book? So um, I spent about 10 years working with women and girls who were subjected to different forms of violence, including trafficking and rape, sexual assault and childhood sexual abuse. And in every single line of work that, I, that I've ever been involved in, there's always been this blame culture. There's always been a way 
um, to look for what she did wrong and what she could have done differently or why she didn't report or something about her character or her behaviour. And so all of that, you know, those years of practice plus my um, psychological research, I wanted to put it into a book to show people quite, you know, how embedded victim blaming is and the psychology behind it. And then maybe we can have a conversation about changing it. Now, blaming women is not a phenomenon restricted to British society, but is a common theme in all societies across the world. What exactly is driving it? There's a number of different theories, biases and belief systems that drive victim blaming of women and girls. People have um, quite a deep cognitive bias that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And so if a woman is raped or abused or assaulted, there must have been something that she did wrong. So people who hold belief in a just world tend to look um, at what the woman did wrong or what she could have done differently. So that's just one theory. And that one is uh, quite a strong theory. It's been found in all different countries, all different religions and cultures and languages across the world. There's also issues around misogyny and sexism that women and girls are objectified and dehumanized and sexualized so that when they are subjected to sexual and domestic violence, we tend to just see them as sex objects or that they led that man on or they were asking for that type of violence. There's also theories around self-preservation, psychological self-preservation. It's about keeping yourself safe from ever realising that these things could happen to you. So by convincing yourself that there was something that that particular woman or girl did wrong, you can tell yourself that you would never make those mistakes. Now, the sad irony about all of this is shortly after the book was published, you yourself became the target of thousands of coordinated attacks from online trolls, culminating in your own personal computer being hacked. My book and some photos of me had been shared on some uh, right-wing and men's rights uh, organisations, forums and Facebook pages, and they were encouraging men to attack me. They were attacking me and then they were also attacking my female followers and that included death threats, rape threats around the book. One man in particular, he privately contacted me as part of this group that was attacking me and told me that the reason I was being attacked was because I'd written this book and that I deserved everything that I got. And he told me that my book and my photos had been shared to these pages and that um, men were being encouraged to attack me because of writing this book about victim blaming of women. And that just shows, doesn't it, Jessica, just how deep-seated those attitudes are. But has the Me Too movement shifted things at all? My view is that Me Too uh, was important and huge, but in terms of whether it's shifted anything systemically or globally, I don't see that it has. I think that potentially women and girls may have felt that they could speak more about what had happened to them, what people had done to them and their experiences of assault, harassment and violence. In terms of whether big systems have taken notice of millions of women disclosing violence, I'm not sure because criminal justice systems haven't changed. In terms of our laws and legislations, they haven't changed. The way that we support women and girls haven't re hasn't really changed. Big question, I know. But what needs to be done to overhaul the system and, more importantly, change people's attitudes? We could change the way we talk to children from a very early age about culpability, responsibility and blame. You know, we start really early talking to little girls and we'll say things like, oh, you know, maybe the boy hits you because he likes you really or because he wants you to pay attention to him. And that's setting those foundations for victim blaming really early. We also talk to teenage girls about things like not being easy, playing hard to get, and that feeds into these beliefs around token resistance. There could be significant work done in the criminal justice system to make it so it wasn't so adversarial towards the victim. Women and girls who've been subjected to male violence will wait 18 months to two years if their case ever goes to trial. In the UK at the moment, we have a prosecution rate for rape at 0.2% of cases. So that means that in the UK, if a woman or girl is raped, she has a 0.2% chance of getting a guilty verdict. Yet then you can look at the media because the media has incredible influence over the way that we position and understand sexual and domestic violence and violence against women and girls, the way that it's sexualized, the way that it is glorified, the way that it is sensationalized, and the way that the media will report 
the rarest cases of uh, homicide, sexual violence and domestic violence and then hold them up as the norm. Dr Jessica Taylor, it's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And finally, the Me Too movement has made its way to Singapore where college students are saying that sexual harassment is far too common and often underreported. As a result, a group has developed a virtual reality program to get people to talk about what harassment looks like, but more importantly, how to call it out. Solange Mujan has the story. Leaning back in what is perhaps revulsion, this student is being sexually harassed through a virtual reality video. In a scripted scenario, a fellow student asks about her underwear. Are you wearing matching underwear? I can't stop thinking about it. After each clip, different responses appear, allowing the victim to practice calling oh, out harassment. So what I said was really out Studies line. have shown that virtual reality can be even more effective than role playing in helping victims counter harassment. Called Girl Talk, the program was set up by four women at Singapore's NTU. The simulations were inspired by actual encounters, and viewers say they felt eerily real. I felt flustered, but I think my first emotion was like shock, because I just felt like my body like freezing up. A government poll showed over one in four women have been sexually harassed in Singapore and only a little over half of them report the abuse. Many say those cases are just the tip of the iceberg and that training can help victims. So we want people to feel empowered to respond in the moment so that thereafter, even if they look back on it, they are like, yeah, you know, in that situation, I did what I could do to protect myself and I feel okay about that. A case of voyeurism at a college campus blew the lid off such harassment last year in a city-state where there is no specific law against sexual harassment. It's dealt with instead under the general penal code. And that's it for this edition. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France 24 51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.